Where is it? Share screen. There it is. Let's do this one. Okay. Can you see the graph there? All right. So because the graph has price on the vertical axis, a change in the price means you either move up the curve or down the curve. The curve does not shift. Okay. If anything else changes, like income, like tastes and preferences, like the price of related goods, then the whole curve shifts. What that means is if you pick a price and the price stays the same, but say your income goes up, you can now afford more at that same price. And so the whole curve is going to shift to the right in that case. Okay, so if it's the price that changes, you move along the curve. If it's anything else, the curve shifts. Okay, does that make sense, Maggie? Got it. Okay, good. Okay, similarly, same thing with supply. The theory of supply says there are a small number of things that affect the amount of some product that a, a producer will sell. Things like the price of the product, the cost of producing the product, um, changes in production technology, expectations, things like that. All right, let me see if I can find our little cheat sheet. Maybe it was down here. Yeah, this is where, where it was. Okay. Um, so once again, let me find the curve. Here we go. Once again, the supply curve shows the relationship between price and quantity supplied. A change in the price just means you're moving up the supply curve or down the supply curve. The curve itself stays the same, all right? On the other hand, when anything else changes that affects supply, so that would be things like changes in the cost of production, um, changes in taxes, subsidies, ch <clears throat> changes in technology, at the same price, the firm now decides it can supply more or it can supply less. So what's happening there is the whole curve shifts. So if anything other than the price changes, the supply curve shifts. All right, any questions about that? Okay, now I did want to show you um, the problem that you guys uh, have, the third assignment. So let me see if I can find it. Let's go here and we'll go here. And we'll go to supply and demand analysis. Okay, so this is the first group assignment and it's a serious supply and demand problem. It has three parts. The first part says, um, suppose the federal government imposes a 25 cent per gallon carbon tax on gasoline. How will that affect the market for gasoline? How will it affect supply? How will it affect demand? How will it affect the equilibrium price and quantity? Okay, so you need to think this through. You need to consider, is this going to shift demand or is this going to shift supply? Draw the graph, um, take a picture, attach it to your submission. Part two says, um, because of a reduction in export sales, the U.S. economy slows down reducing family incomes. How will a reduction in family incomes affect the market for gasoline? How will it affect supply? How will it affect demand? How will it affect equilibrium price and quantity? Again, draw the graph, explain what's going on, send me your explanation in the pictures. And then finally, part three is suppose both one and two happen. You have to sort of combine the analysis. What's going to be the combined effect on supply, demand, equilibrium price, and quantity? So those of you who are in my class last semester have had these questions before, okay? Um, a question like this will be on the first exam, so let's figure out how to get this right. Okay, um, so an additional problem, wrinkle for this assignment is that not everyone has reached out and connected with their groups. So that's probably the most important thing that you do. Okay, the problem itself 
won't take all that long. Okay, the due date is a week from Friday. So that should give you plenty of time, assuming that you don't wait until Thursday night, a week from now to get started. Becca would never do that, I, I know. All right. Any questions about the assignment? Good. All right, let me come back. In the oven, Becca? Good, good. All right, um, let's see. The other thing that I wanted to talk about um, that was on the list was, uh, there were two other things on the list. One was questions about surplus, consumer surplus, producer surplus, dead weight loss, all of that stuff. And the other was price ceilings and price floors. Um, I thought we would do price ceilings and price floors tonight um, because that's the most, uh, the closest to what we were just talking about, basic supply and demand. Um, and then we'll do, um, we'll do the surpluses next week. Okay. Um, here, let me find my other graph. All right. There's actually a really nice video about price ceilings and price floors are exactly the opposite in that module. Let me show you. All right. All right, let's just run the beginning of this video. Production quality is very nice. In the next several videos, we'll dive deeper into price ceilings and also price floors. These are important for two reasons. First, governments around the world, both today and historically, often do impose price ceilings and floors. So we want to understand their effects. Second, in the last section, we explained how a price is a signal wrapped up in an incentive. In this section, we'll be explaining, well, what happens when that signal, that price, is not allowed to do its work? When the price is not allowed to rise or fall? What happens when that signal is not sent? What happens when that incentive is taken away? A price ceiling is a maximum price allowed by law. So for example, if the price ceiling on gasoline is $2.50, it is illegal to buy or sell gasoline at above that price. It's called a ceiling because you cannot go above the ceiling. So a ceiling is a maximum price. It has five important effects. It's gonna create shortages, reductions in product quality, wasteful lines and other search costs, a loss, in gains from trade or a deadweight loss and a misallocation of resources. We're going to go through each of these. Let's be. Oh, sorry. I wanted to shortages. go one, one step further. We can easily show that price ceilings create shortages using our standard demand and supply framework. We'll use the price of gasoline as an example because governments often have imposed a maximum price on gasoline. Now, ordinarily, we would know that the market equilibrium would be found where the quantity demanded is equal to the quantity supplied. But suppose that the government imposes a maximum price which is below the market equilibrium. So this is a controlled price, a maximum price above which it is illegal to buy or sell this good. What we wanna do now is simply read off the diagram what happens. So at the controlled price, we can read that the quantity demanded given by the demand curve is here. At the controlled price, the quantity supplied is given by the supply curve and is read here. Okay, now um, think about it. Because the price ceiling is below the equilibrium price, what's going to happen to the quantity demanded at a lower price? It's going to go up. Thank you. Okay. Um, but what's going to happen to the quantity supplied? it's gonna go down, right? So demand goes up, but supply goes down. 
creating this shortage here. Okay, now what, um, what uh, Professor Tabarak goes on to say is if this was a free market, the shortage would cause prices to rise and we would go back to the market equilibrium. But with a price ceiling, it's against the law for the price to go up. And so we're stuck in that situation. Now, there's one important thing to notice here. What happens to sales of this product? The equilibrium quantity was here, right? That's how many, that's how many gallons of gasoline were bought and sold. After the price ceiling, does the quantity go up or down? Is it down? Why? Because you can only buy what is supplied. Yes, exactly. Okay. It doesn't matter that this many people want to buy it. If business is only supplying this amount, then the actual quantity of gasoline sales is going to fall. Okay. And you, I mean, it makes sense because if businesses, if a gas station is going to get paid less, it's going to produce less. Okay. And that's a problem. Well, it's, it, um, it is, it is a complication here. Think about how this affects different people. Okay. Um, the business is worse off because they're not allowed to charge a higher price. So their profits are going to be down. Okay. Is this good or bad for consumers? Be careful. It's a trick question. Bethany. Hi. So what happened to the price when we imposed the ceiling? It went down. It went down. So you might say, well, that's good for consumers, right? Because they get gas at a cheaper price. Why is that not a completely correct answer? Because the supply is also lower. Yeah, some people don't get the gas that they were willing to pay more for, right? Here's what the old quantity was. Here's what the new quantity is. So this many people don't get the gas at all. So it's a complicated issue. People that still get the gas get a better price, but other people get kicked out entirely. So it's not obvious whether this is good or bad for consumers. It's good for some consumers, not good for others. All right. Okay. Now, price floors work exactly the opposite way. A price floor is a legal minimum price. So it would be up here. With a price floor, the quantity supplied is higher than the quantity demanded. So you have a surplus. Okay. If this were a free market, when you have a surplus, the price would fall back to equilibrium, but it can't do that. It's stuck here. So what happens to gasoline sales if this was a price floor instead of a price ceiling, if we were up here? Do gas, gasoline sales go up or down compared to where we were at the equilibrium? What do you think, Emily? Nothing. You don't think anything? No, because the floor is, wait, oh wait, no. No, never mind. That would be if it were a ceiling. No, no, it doesn't matter because, because with a ceiling here, the quantity went down because you can't make, you can't make businesses sell stuff that they're not gonna make a profit on. So if it was a, a floor, and the price was up here, what's gonna to happen to the quantity? It's gonna go up. This is how much businesses wanna sell, which is great. But Morgan says, hey, the price of gasoline is so high, I'm just not gonna buy, I'm gonna buy, I'm gonna stay here. So whichever 
whether it's supply or demand, which is less, that's the constraint. And so also with the price floor, the quantity is gonna actually- Notice that at the control. Sorry, that was an accident. Okay, so in both cases, we end up with less quantity being, less gasoline being sold. And that's a problem. Okay, again, the important thing to realize here is the way you work through the problem is you decide what price you're at and you go over to the demand curve and you read the quantity demanded and you go over to the supply curve and you read the quantity supplied and then you figure out, are they equal? Well, no. In the case of a floor, the quantity supplied is greater than the quantity demanded. In the case of a, a ceiling, it's the opposite. And then you have to figure out what are the, what are the consequences of that. Okay, in general, both with a price ceiling and with a price floor, there are sort of unintended consequences. There are winners and there are losers, and they're not always who we expect. Which is why we don't have a lot of price ceilings and price floors. All right, any questions about that? So the price, with a price ceiling, there's more demand, right? With a price ceiling, right. The quantity demand goes from here to here. Because when the price goes down, the quantity demanded goes up. That's the law of demand. Okay. Other questions? How long does a chicken cook, Becca? 30 minutes. Oh my gosh, I'm gonna be eating before that. <laughs> That's the beauty of stir fry. Yep, I got 12 more minutes. Awesome. Okay, that's all I've got for tonight. What questions do you have um, about anything in the course so far? Did you guys see that? Good. Do we still stay with the outline? Like do another module analysis, even if we're behind? No, so, so you can wait a week, basically. Okay. Okay, so let me, let me pull that up. All right, here, and I'll share here. All right, so, According to the calendar, this is the week that we're in, right? Week three. But we're, real, we're still actually working on topic two. So it's as if the whole calendar shifts down one week. Like, let me see, can I actually do this? Would, this would be cool. Let's see, try this. Shells, sells and shift down. Yeah, like that. Oh, the magic of computers. Okay, so what that means is, is that we'll be doing elasticity next week. The exam will still be on the 14th, but it just won't cover as much material. Other questions? How many minutes do you have now, Becca? Nine. Okay. We're getting there. We are. All right. Well, if nobody has any more questions, um, I'm going to call it an evening. Um, you can always reach me during the week by sending me an email or dropping in. And otherwise, we'll talk again next Wednesday. 
Great.